Hello, mate. Good evening, finally, huh? <laughs> you don't look any different. I wished. I wished. It's so strange for me because I was 11 when you joined me at Wall. Right. Well, I was, I was yeah, I, was, I mean, obviously, I was working stuff out. Yeah. It's, I mean, I was, you know, when I see the photograph, my first photograph of like the, you know, the team picture day. Yeah. <clears throat> and at that point, I'm about to become a father. And, and I look at myself and I'm, I'm 24, but I must, I look about 10. <laughs> Got this little cheeky little fringe thing going on where all the, all the kids have got on now with the, Honestly, it's ridiculous when I see the first, when I see the first like team photograph, like individual one from, um, you know, putting <clears throat> putting the lion's kit on. It's, a, it's, a, it's just ridiculous. It's ridiculous yeah. how young I look. You got like, you got a little bit of a cool going on later on as well. You? <laughs> a, little bit, a little bit of a slick back. I've had, to be fair, I've had all sorts over the years. When I was at Forest, there was a kid who did the program, uh, and he said, "How would you feel about me putting like a." Because obviously at the time I was the captain, he said, how would you feel about putting a montage of all your different hairstyles? I went, don't you ever dare even think about it because there were some <laughs> rascals. But there you go. There you go. He's Dedicated and following a fashion nut. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, had some, I've had some bad ones down the years. I'm just glad to be clinging on to it now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I always say, the one the one thing I'm always glad for when you see some of the lads who I've played with and and to be fair, I've been doing, I've been, I've been doing some work with... Uh, with Paul Ince and Alec Ray, and obviously Alex, Alex fullockly challenged. So, uh, so I, I, all, I, all I would say is exactly what you said. I'm glad to still have some at my age. Do you know what I mean? I was with them the other day, Paul Ince and Alex Ray. I was doing. Um... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I've been doing. Um, obviously, when Ince took over in the caretaker role, um, mm. as you do, I just sent him a message, wished him all the best, and then he just said, "Well, what are you doing?" I said, "Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this work for the agency since I came back from China." which I was away for like nearly two years. Um, and I'd just become a grandfather. So I said, you know, the agency work gives me a bit more flexibility on the diary. And he said, well, do you not want to come down with me and Alex? And I said, listen, I, I can't commit full time. I said, I'm up here. Um, obviously you are where you are. I said, you know, I'd love to help in any way, shape or form I can. Um, I said, but for what you and Alex are going to be doing, I can't, I can't do that because, you know, I promised these guys at the agency uh, would just merge with another another agency, and I just said, <clears throat> you know, I need to be out and about watching games and supporting the clients. And mm-hmm. so I had a word with the uh, I had a word with because we just joined. Can you remember John Regis, the Olympic sprinter? Yeah, I do. Big, powerfully built one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, John yeah. has a company called Astra. Uh, I was working for another company when I came back from China, and Astra had. Split away from, uh, they, they used to be with another agency called Stella, which is a huge organisation. Yeah. Um, they'd pulled away from Stella and, and John and his ex-wife, uh, Jennifer, had set up Astra Partners. Um, uh, but they obviously they're purely athletics. <clears throat> and through a friend of a friend, they said, we're looking to start up a, a football division. So the guys who I was working with, a company called The Sports Agents, um, Again, just through a connection of a connection, they just said, "Would you be interested?" So yeah, so that's only only got. I mean, it's only just been launched on LinkedIn today. We've only, I mean, we've been we've probably merged maybe about a month, but it's only just been officially launched on LinkedIn today. So, so basically, again, you know, I had I, t- I had to have that commitment. I promised John and Jennifer. Um, but then I said what I said to Paul and to Alec. I said, "Listen, if if you want anything, I can I can I could do a day a week, but." Unfortunately, that's all I could do. So, so to be fair, for the last eight weeks, I've been going down for a day a week, just doing some work with them on the training ground, which was great because um, I haven't been doing any coaching since since I left uh, since I left China, really. So, yeah. so, it was nice to do a bit of that. Nice to reconnect with NC and Alec, um, and and thankfully, um, thankfully that you know the eight, eight weeks in and two weeks to go, you know they've got the job done that they went in to do, which is to mm. keep them up and and hopefully you know they can whatever they decide to do moving forward, they can start planning and uh, putting things in place. But no, it's been, it's been good, good, two good people. Alex. Yeah. I mean, Alex, funny. I mean, he, he hasn't changed, has he, over the years? Huh? He hasn't other, than, other than the loss of the barnet, yeah. Hey, other than... <laughs> funny enough, I work for a PR and sports management company called Roth Limits Entertainment. And my All boss right. is it's his agent. Oh, is it? Right, yeah. got you. And we was doing something with um, Select Car Leasing. Got you, yeah. Our... Our, um, my boss also is Judd Trump's agent and he's sponsored oh, yeah, yeah. Select. So we, we got together and 
it was uh, Judd versus Paul Ince for like a, a snooker match sort of thing. Yes, I did hear about it. And Alex has just rocked up and he's spotting the balls. Alex putting the colours back on. I'm like, what is going on here? But we've just started. Um, I'm head of content production, but we they've just started a, a, a football agent side. We just signed Jermaine Defoe today. Oh bloody hell! Wow. Yeah, well done. We do, we do export stars, but we also we're venturing into like current players now as well. So. Yeah. So what do you mean to to kind of on for the entertainment circuit, if you like? So no. Well, we already did that, but now they're going into like professional football as well, getting them contracts oh, okay. for clubs because. My boss used to be a football agent for years. Jimmy Irwin, his name was. Right. Um, so, yes, so, uh, doing a similar sort of thing by the sound of it. Uh, listen, it's, it's, it's very different for me. Not something I ever saw myself doing. But as I say, I've spoken to the guys two years ago when I, I mean, literally just after I'd agreed to do the Chinese thing when I came out of the FA. Um, and I said to them, listen, uh, I knew I was going to come back last June because I, I knew that um, my daughter was expecting in August. So I needed to be back in the country. Mm. There was a good cut-off point with the Chinese because we just qualified for the next round of the Asian qualifying for the World Cup. And then there was obviously September, October, November, December. Um, but I said, you know, I need to be back in the UK <clears throat> by the end of June, July at the latest. Um, of course. So I came back, I came back in June. Um, and like I said, it became became a grandfather and then I, I just reconnected with the lads from the agency. They said, you know, you, do, do you still want to come on board? So we sat down and had a chat and I said, you know, for the, for the, because I'd been away this last stint, I'd been away 10 months without being able to get home because of COVID and visas and et cetera. Mm. So I just said, well, this gives me a bit more flexibility. I get to see my girls. I get to see my granddaughter um, and, you know, still get out and watch football, still speak to coaches, managers, et cetera, et cetera, which I've done. And yes, yeah, so, so it was, for me, it's kind of just given me a good opportunity to have a bit of time for me <clears throat> for myself, but also reconnect with all the lads I know in football. And as I say, you know, and, and then it was the extra thing with with NC and Alec was just was just a nice little a nice little difference. Um, and as I say, thankfully, you know, the work that we've done, you know, as as poor as Reading have been, unfortunately, it's it's just been enough to get get us over the line, you know. And the you know the twelve games. Since Alec and Paul went in, you know they've they've managed to win four, lose five, and and, and draw a couple. So you know they, they've done the job that we went in to do, which is brilliant. And it's nice to have been, you know, even just a small part of that, you know. Yeah, it's just mad, you know, how just staying in touch with people and having a chat can open doors, can't it? Yeah, well, it was just one of those. Like I said, me and Inc. Uh, because we, um, you know, Inc. came to Middlesbrough for a spell towards the end of his career, and we just, you know, we just had a connection, you know. Um, Obviously, from when I was down south, you know, I, um, I, had, a, I, had, a, I had a little connection with, with Ian Wright, Les Ferdinand, um, and Inti was, you know, they're, they're really close anyway. So, I don't know, it, it just seemed really natural. And, and Inti and I have just kept in touch randomly over the years, um, doing our various things. And then, uh, yeah, it was, just, it was just a message of good luck. It was simple as that. And then he said, well, why don't you come down? Um, because obviously the work I was doing, at the FA was 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 leading the out of possession thing. Reading had conceded a silly amount of goals, and he just said we need we need to put some structure into the team. So, so that's what we did. We set off and just give them a bit of structure. Um, and as I say, thankfully we've uh, got the job done with a couple of weeks to go. And just hope I just hope that they don't go flat and, and lose the last two because they, I went to watch them on Saturday against Hull and they weren't very good. So, um, you know, in the concession of goals, they were okay going forward, which they've been all season. They can score. But when possession turns over, they, they they're pretty poor. So I just I just hope that even though the job's done, they've got a home game on Saturday against West Brom. I just hope they get something out of that. And then if they get battered at Luton on the final day of the season, well, that's fair, that's fair enough. But I just hope for the home fans they get something on Saturday. You know? Yeah. Wasn't they four one down against Swansea? Come back four four. Yeah, it was ridiculous. I mean, yeah. Because I'm like you know I've been to some of the games and sometimes I have to go and watch my clients. So I, you know I said to Inti from from day one. I won't be able to get to all the games. Certainly can't be involved in what you and Alec are doing. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'd been to watch a game, uh, a, a youth game on the morning, came back and watched that and then watching, watching it unfold, going to goal up and then 2-1 down, 3-1 down, 4-1 down, you just going. And I said to Inti and Alec, after the game, I feared for a 6 or a 7. And to be fair, so did they. But then as soon as Thomas scored... You could just feel momentum shift in the game, and Swansea yeah. went and, and Reading got got the tails up, and it ends up with a four four. But as a as a coach who's uh, who's trying to stop them conceding goals, it's not something I want to see. Do you know what I mean? And 
Do you like the three, three and the three that we conceded on Saturday? I'm sat there next to uh, next to Wincy's wife Claire, and I'm just saying this this is not what I want to see. But yeah. hey, like I said, job's done. So that's that's the most important thing for the for Reading anyway. We played um, we played Swansea the other week at home, Mill War, and they popped it really nice. We 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 pressed them and it played into yeah. their hands really because they just sharp and just missing us out. Beat the press and then they're in. You know what I mean? They, they deserve it winners that night. I have to say, I mean, I know, I know the, the championship is ridiculous, eh? but I have to, I have to say that when um, one of the first games I saw was obviously when Millwall came to Reading, um, and you know it was only a one niler. But I said, <clears throat> I said, I said to Inti and Alec after the game, obviously with the connection, I, I just said I thought if nothing else, Millwall are probably the most organised and toughest team to beat in the league, and they defend the goal really, really well. Um, but you know, hopefully, uh, you know, I know it's uh, it's all nip and tuck, isn't it? So let's let's uh, you know, hopefully, there's uh, there's still something at the end of the season as tough as it might be. Yeah. Well, listen, mate, we haven't we haven't officially started yet. I usually yeah, do an cool. introduction. Sorry, but um, yeah, we just talk about you know, you come into Millwall, you can time at Millwall. Then I usually you know the players usually leave their contract runs out, but you've obviously gone on to to uh, bigger things. Had a great career. So we just go through it, if that's all right. We've got about an hour. Of course, yeah, absolutely. No problem. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Okay, so do a little intro and then we're, we're, we're away. Cool. Okay, so we're going to go in three, two, one. Lions Lounge Lockdown, episode 57. Colin Cooper. Colin, thanks for joining us, mate. Absolute pleasure, mate. Absolute pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Now, you down in the end. Took me a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we... We have been trying a little while, to be fair, haven't we? But uh, yeah, but thankfully you've, you've you've managed to nail me down, and that's the most important thing. Yes, it's a, it's an interesting one because widely regarded, even to this day, I do videos sometimes about you know tell people tell me your best eleven, and literally everyone puts you in it as as you know an all time meal great in the in your position. Um, you wasn't at the club for two years, nineteen ninety one to nineteen ninety three, mm. seventy seven games, six goals. We have a goal scoring centre back, wouldn't you? Well, to be fair, I had I had this conversation with someone the other day um, yeah. about goal setting and targets. And you know, when I was a when I was a fullback, for instance, when I came obviously came from Middlesbrough, and I was a fullback originally when Bruce was manager. Mm. Um, there was nothing nothing in them lines, but it was literally when 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 Mick, you know, it was big big Mick McCarthy who, who kind of turned me into a centre back for the second time in my career because I'd been I'd been asked to play as this kind of centre half stroke sweeper when I was what 18, 19 under a former manager at Middlesbrough, Willie Madrin, who sadly uh, sadly no longer with us. Um he tried to mould me into a centre half sweeper. But you know I wasn't the tallest, not the biggest. Um but to be fair to Big Mick, um Big Mick said to me on the day that he got the job that uh he said, listen, you know, I, I can't play Obviously, we've got Rhino, we've got people like Alan Mac, uh, Alan McCleary, he said, but I need someone who who I know can defend, uh, who I know can is brave, who I know can do what I want him to do. And he said, on the back of that, he said, I want to put Ian Dawes back in the, back in the team as a left-back. So, so basically, I think when you look at it logically, basically Mick was just saying, this is, this is, this is you in the team, or you're not in the team, if you like. Yeah. But, um, and also, because he came... You know, originally when when Bruce brought him in, you know, he came as a player. So basically, when he gets the job, you're helping a mate. You know, at the end of the day, you, you people in the dressing room. And when Mick said to me, "Coops, I need you to play centre back," and I said, "Listen, you're my mate. I'll do anything I possibly can to help you." And yeah, and and thankfully, it, it worked for all of us. Yeah, similar story. I think Alex Ray said to me that he wanted him to play right side of the diamond. That he said, "No, no." And he said, "Not playing there." Now he said, "All right, no worries." Ding dropped. Yeah. Uh, six days later, Alex went, yeah, well, I'll play on the right side of the diamond. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and and as we were talking be, be, before we started, you know, I've spent a bit of time with Alex recently and, and yeah. Alec obviously has some amazing memories of his time at the Den and and obviously he was there before me and, and, and kind of there after me. But, yeah. you know, if you think of, you know, if you think about the youth team that Tom Wally had around that time and you think about some of the players that were in the football club at the time, you know, Millwall have a lot, you know, and, and players who were before me who, who had fabulous careers, you know, the, the ones that you don't even need to mention, you know, the likes of Cass and, and Ted, Teddy Sheringham and people. Like, fabulous football careers and the club has to take an awful lot of credit. And especially if you look back at that youth team in particular under Tom Wally and you've got people like Ben Thatcher, Andy Roberts, Kenny Cunningham, and you can, you know, it's, mm. they produce some wonderful players down the years. And, Definitely. and yeah, so I think, uh, you know, everyone... 
everyone outside of the club has the perception of Millwall, but I think we all we all know the real Millwall inside is is a club who, yeah, you, you've got to wear your heart on your sleeve. You've got to you've got to prove that you're worthy. You're wearing the badge, but also the people want to see you try and play decent football. And mm-hmm. and to be able to play decent football, you've got to you've got to have had some some background of, of of decent coaching in order to be able to handle the football. And and as I say, some of the players that were in the club previous and some of the players that came around the same time who were younger and then went on and had careers. There's some fabulous players come through the football club. Yeah, you said to me there, you answered one of my questions because I sort of remember you as I was 11 when you came to the club. So I actually thought you was left-footed, but I've seen some goals you scored today. You're definitely <laughs> right-footed. But was you a full-back? Was you turned into a centre-back? You, you to me, I remember, was not just blowing your trumpet because you're on the show, like a new age, like what we get now of a centre-back. You could play as well. Yeah, well, listen, at, at the end of the day, um, I know that there's many, many stories, but as a kid, at the, at the age that you would say that, you know, when I came down there, the age you were, I was a central midfield player. So, right. you know, I used to see myself as, yeah, I was, I was, I was, I used to see myself as a goal scorer and central midfield player, box to box. Um, you know, when I played for um, the school and the, the, the district and the county, as we have up north, everything, you know, I was, I was, I was central midfield player alongside Paul Gaskine for Durham County. So, so it was like, yeah, yeah, because we, we were the same age, we played in the same teams when we were kids. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so that, that's what I was. So when fast forward to when uh, Bruce Riott came to Middles was a coach under the aforementioned Willie Madron. Um, when Middles were went into liquidation, basically we had we had thirteen players. So all Bruce and Bruce and Colin Todd tried to do is just mould the team. So I had a I had a competition with a guy called Gary Gill. Uh, to play centre midfield in that team, he won the competition. The position that was left, uh, yeah, that's that's how life goes. The position that was left, and Bruce Riott and Colin Todd helped me enormously through them through them early years. Um, was was left fullback, and you're right, I am. I'm absolutely ninety percent uh, right footed, and you know I can I can swing the lead from time to time. But um, yeah, I had to, I had a lot of help um, from from Colin Todd in particular. Bruce Leoc took me under my wing, under his wing, and uh, and yeah, and moulded me into. They knew I could handle a football, they knew I could run, they knew I could jump, they knew I could defend. It was just a case of turning a central midfield player into a, a, a right footed left back, if you like. And yeah. yeah, and as you say, if you think about some of the ones down the years, it's it has certain advantages. You know, when you're defending, you're always defending on your strong side, as in crosses coming from the opposite side, it's always on your right foot. Obviously, trying to help the attack. That's that's when you found out a little bit as I as I was over the years. But yeah, so the the switch in itself wasn't so drastic because um, because yeah, I think you know the things as I, as I spoke earlier, the things that Big Mick when he took the job saw in me as a person were okay. I'm not the size of Big Mick. I'm not the frame of Big Mick, but he knew I could handle the ball. He knew I was prepared to put my body on the line. He knew I could jump and he knew I could play. So I think when he asked me to play a centre-back when he first got the job, it was a case of, listen, this is something new for you. You're, you're coming out of our dressing room with mates and we'll, all, we'll always do something to help our mates. So, yeah, and it, it luckily, I have to, and it, 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 there always is a sense of, you know, things can go really well or they can go really wrong. And I have to say, for the rest of my career, I have to say it was a genius move. And, I've, you know, that, that was it from that point on. I played in midfield a few times when I was at Forest. I pushed one up. Um, but primarily, you know, the, the career that I had, um, when Mick put me in the team as a centre-back, and then from there on for the next X amount of years, well, 12 years, you know, I was a centre-back. So, so yeah, it, it's amazing how these little things happen in football. Yeah, definitely paid dividends as well, didn't it? Moving on. But yeah, for sure. I know it's um I know it's a Mill podcast, but it will be absolutely criminal of me if I didn't ask you about Gaz and what he was like. Amazing. Uh listen, I've I've just, you know, I've I've watched the the, the documentary that's been on TV. Um the, the things that I always say about Paul are, as I say, um I know I know what he went through as a kid, um, you know, with with some some tragedies, you know, because uh, one of the guys who I was an apprentice with at Middlesbrough was his best mate. Right. And, you know, there's a story about <clears throat> one of Gaza's best mates, his little brother getting hit by a car when he was, when Gaza was only 11. Right. Um, 
And that, that and Gaz's best mate was a guy called Keith Spraggan. And Keith Spraggan was an apprentice at Middlesbrough with me. So I know I know about that. We played, we played, um, we played uh county football together because Gaza was born in Gateshead, not in Newcastle. So Gateshead is in County Durham, not in Tyne and Weir. So we played for the same county team. And then, you know, many times, you know, he was obviously at Newcastle, I was at Middlesbrough, so there was a bit of rivalry then when uh, when Gaza went to Tottenham and, and and obviously skyrocketed through the roof. I the things I'll always say about Paul are he was by far head and shoulders the best player of my generation. Mm-hmm. And 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 I, I'll never I'll never take that back. One of the kindest guys I've ever met in my life. If you wanted a pound and he had a pound, you'd get the pound and he wouldn't have a pound. Yeah, yeah. Um the other stuff, some of the stuff that you know is talked about and, and rightly so, is that basically he would do anything for a laugh. Anything. <laughs> anything. I mean, and like even even when he came, he came back, he came to Middlesbrough a spell. When I went back to Middlesbrough when I was 31, Paul came back and you know, even some of the some of the things is it's it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous what he would do just to just to get people to have a laugh and a giggle and and, and make other people laugh. And you know that. We all we all have we all have flaws we all have things, um, but again you know my my the, the things I would always say about him is absolute genius, and again watching the documentary and you you put that into perspective of modern day football, mm. geniuses can slot into anything. He would be an absolute superstar right now because of, because of what he could do with the football. You talk about people who can. You know, when you people when a lot of teams are trying to beat a low block, if you like, and having the ability to to go past someone to break a line instead of, you know, we see a lot of tick attack passing and et cetera, et cetera. Gaza had an un, un, unbelievable ability just to drop his shoulder and go past people. Strong, quick, could create, could score. He could fit into any generation. So yeah. you're right. Um the, some of the things he would do would would certainly be a little bit over the edge for me as a person. But hey, you know, I hold my hands up and I say, you know, that there's times when he's had me in stitches. There's times when you when you kind of go and oh really, but the, the other times are absolute genius with a football yeah. and an absolute gentleman. Oh, brilliant! That's 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 the main thing, mate. Um, so you said about County Durham, you came through the ranks. Did you come through the ranks at Middlesbrough? And was you a Borough fan? That's what I was going to ask you. Well, yeah, strange. Um, I wasn't. Uh, is the honest truth. Um, all of my family. My grandfather was a scout for Sunderland. And my father didn't play professionally, but he played. Uh, he played kind of amateur league up in the northeast. Mm. My dad was a, a coal miner, so he, you know he had a lot of hours. He had to he worked before he had a chance to do anything else. So not all of my family was Sunderland. Um, my best mate, my best mate, my best man is a huge, huge Sunderland fan. It's it's one of those. Um, back in the old days, when you signed for a club when you were thirteen as, a, as an associated schoolboy, um, I had a choice. Um, you know, my parents didn't. Pressure me, you know. I had a choice to come south. I had a choice to go um, west. Um, I had a choice to stay in the northeast with the northeast teams, uh, all three of them. And basically, the, the honest answer is, even going back to that point, um, Middlesbrough had a reputation of giving young players an opportunity. Um, yeah. So even at thirteen, when the, and the guy who scouted me for Middlesbrough, who I still speak to now, as as you as you tend to do, is you know he's ninety two years of age now and. I only, I only had a phone call with him maybe a couple of months ago. Um, it was one of those that <clears throat> he sat with my mum and dad um, and the club just had a feel. It had a feel. Um, my best mate slaughtered me, obviously, because he was a massive Sullen fan. Um, and thankfully for him, and I, I mean I mean this in a genuine way, when I was 37, I spent, and Big Mick was at Sunderland as the manager. Right. Big Mick asked me to go up to Sunderland um, on loan. So, uh, so I eventually did wear the Sunderland shirt and uh, and got my name on the back, and, and obviously that went to my best mate, my best man. So he was, he said, after uh, after twenty five years of waiting, I finally get to see you in a Sunderland shirt. So, but yeah, that that that's basically it. Middlesbrough had a reputation for giving young players an opportunity. So I signed for Middlesbrough when I was thirteen, then went on a YTS scheme when I was sixteen, um, signed professional contract at seventeen, and. As I mentioned, Willie Madrin before, he was my youth team coach, became the first team manager, and he kind of gave me an opportunity and, and, and obviously one that I'd always be grateful for. Definitely, mate, definitely. And then obviously you moved south eventually, 1991. Um, I'm, t- I'm taking, obviously that was the Bruce Riot connection, brought you down south. 300 yeah, well, listen, a lot of money then. 
Yeah, well, listen, at the end of the day, there's, there's certain things happen. When my career was, with, you know, getting into the first team at 17, 18, 19, establishing Middlesbrough having a really good spell, a good couple of years, two promotions in two years, up to what is now obviously the Premier League back then, the first division. Um, and being noticed, even though, you know, again, we go back to the scenario, I was a central midfield player playing as a left back. But, you know, you get some nice things. I got into the England under-21 setup <clears throat> um, with Dave Sexton. And yeah, everything was everything was flying. Everything was going nice. Um, then I broke a bone in my foot, which wouldn't heal. Um, I tried to play with it for the best part of six months. The season that Middlesbrough got relegated out of the first division. Um, tried to tried to plow on within you know as we did back in them days with injection after injection after injection. Eventually caught up with me, um, and that that niggled with me for probably about a year. Mm. Even though I got back, you know, I healed, I got back playing, it would rear its head, I would start getting in pain again, my form started dipping. So, um, so in 1991, the, the honest scenario is we just, we just saved, we've just saved ourselves from being relegated. For, you know, we got promotion, promotion at Middlesbrough, then we got relegated on the very last day of the season, or two, two Saturdays before the end of the season, in, uh, in nine, you know, the season of 1991. Yeah. We basically saved ourselves. We beat Newcastle 4-1 on, on, on the, I think, the last Saturday of the season or the season or the week before. And, and in that summer, I was due to get married. Um, and I knew, hand on heart, that my football career had levelled off. It wasn't doing that anymore. It levelled off and it was starting to dip. Yeah. So in that summer, I was getting married. And basically, Bruce got into me and he just said, listen, why don't, why don't you come with me? He said, you know what I think about you. Come down, play, enjoy your football again. You've just been married. It'll be a new start for you and your wife. Um, so, you know, having had the discussions with everybody, we said, well, why not? Um, and you're right, you know, it, even, even though my career was, was, was dipping, that's a fact, um, everything became very fresh, excitable again. And, you know, in, in all fairness, I remember when I came down, I think it was in the uh, in the fanzine or it might have even been in the South London press. You know, some people saying, you know, we paid 300,000 for this guy. Um, you know, having seen him play a few times, you know, over a, over a year or two, we might get half a million quid back. Um, so to be fair, I think, you know, it was it was a, it was a decent gamble from Bruce, really, because like mm -hmm. you say, 300 grand wasn't to be sniffed at back in them days. No. Um, and even though it didn't quite work out for me and Bruce in that initial spell when I came down, um, thankfully, um, you know, Bruce went on and, and, and obviously forged his career. Um, you know, we had a decent spell, just fell short in that second year. You know, we finished seventh with Mick as the manager. Um, and yeah, it, it, like I say, it, then the career went again, which was mm -hmm. amazing because I was, you know, you, you're then getting into the realms of 25, 26 and really, you know, it's like everyone says at them points, you're supposed to be in your prime. Um, but no, I, and I have to say, you know, Big Mick knows that the summer that I went away on holiday um, and we, me and Mick were in contact because, you know, there was interest from Nottingham Forest. They'd just been relegated, obviously, into the same league. Mm. And Big Mick just said, listen, Colt, he said, I don't want you to leave. I can't afford, I can't afford to give you a new contract of what you're worth, what I genuinely feel as though you're worth. Millwall can't afford to turn the money down that Nottingham Forest are offering. So therefore, my advice to you as a friend and as your manager is that you go and speak to them and we all, we all have to get on with the rest of our careers. And yeah, it was tough. It was tough because you, you, people don't realise, you know, we, we were quite settled. You know, we, we were living just outside of Locksbottom at the time. You know, um, like I said, we had, a, we had one daughter and, and one on the way. And, and yeah, you, you, you don't, you don't expect things to happen, but in football they do and they happen pretty quickly. So I was on holiday. I had a conversation with Mick. I ended up having to fly back into England, go and meet Frank Clark and um, his assistant, Alan Hill in London. And the deal was done. Um, and, you know, the only thing I would say is that when I, when I remember the article back about the guy saying, you know, he might be worth, he might be worth half a million quid in a year or two's time if, you know, if things go well. Well, thankfully, I managed to I managed to get back. You know, managed to get back five times of that for the for the football club. So you can't. Uh, so let's hope we all think of it as a win win. And and the, the 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 one thing which I always find heartening when I come back and I was I was there recently um, when Middlesbrough played. I came down was with with Horney in the in the lounge upstairs for the Middlesbrough game. Is is the warmth? Yeah, it's always I always get the warmth and 
and the way the Millwall fans were when when we lost our little boy and, and the, the charity matches that we had and and the and like I say, whatever whatever people's perceptions of Millwall and in inverted commas, that ain't the football club. The, the club and the people who support the football club are warm and all they want all they want for their players is to show that you you give us stuff. And you know, thankfully, uh, thankfully, as as you as you very kindly said, you know, I still get a nice reception and I still get some warmth from the people when I come back. And so it's always it's always a pleasure to come back down. Yeah, that's brilliant, mate. That's brilliant. I was just wondering, I was going to ask you about the transition from north to south. Was it difficult? But maybe it didn't sound like it was. It took to it like. Oh, a listen, I, I think it was cost my. You know, I was a kid at Middlesbrough, twenty minutes from where my parents live, um, by car. And yeah, so that becomes the easy thing. The hard thing is, you know, uh, having just been married, convincing uh, convincing my wife that it, it was a it was a sensible move. Um, but we, we we chose we chose to give it a go. And um, and as I say, you know, initially we spent six months in a in a flat in Beckenham, um, and then we moved into a place actually. <laughs> We actually moved into a house next door to John McGinley, and I don't think I don't think McGinn was too happy <laughs> that we'd kind of moved. I mean, literally, where was we that? Didn't that, was, know. that? Was it in Was it? it no, we were in uh, we were just we were a place just outside of Locksbottom, just outside of Bromley. Because um, John McGinley, um, when I was a kid, he used to live in the next road to me in Wellington at one point. I think, yeah, because I think then I don't. I, hopefully, it wasn't anything to do with you me moving him in out. The store, but yeah, but he, he moved out fairly quickly. So hopefully, that move was on the cards for him anyway. But but yeah, so we, uh, so yeah, we were like I say, we literally um, lived there, and then uh, and then as I say, you know, football being football, we we'd settled down. Um, like I say, Mick was more than happy to try and get me a new contract, and and I'm hopefully, sorry, was your contract up at this point? Well, yeah, it was, yeah. Um, so it was a case of Mick, you know, again said. I can't get you something that you're a value. Yeah. Um, well, actually, no, my contract probably wouldn't have been up at the time. But Mick... Well, it would have been, been, been before the Bosman rule. Saw some, yeah, saw some value of me and um, he, he wanted to he wanted to try and get me a new deal because he knew there were clubs sniffing around. And and basically, he just, like I said, you know, when I explained before, it was just an honest open thing between two mates and, and a player and a manager. And he just said, you know, I can't afford to turn that money down for the football club. I can't afford to pay you what I genuinely think that I'd wish I could. He said, so therefore we, we need to, we need to do the deal and, and you need to get the best deal you can moving forward to Forest. So it was just, yeah, it's just one of them things that happened. And no, we, we, you know, we, we were newly married. We were only young. So yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a smooth transition, but for me, yeah, of course it, I, I go and play football every day. That's, that's what I've done since I was a kid. Mm. I would suggest that, you know, my wife, um, my wife would have found it probably harder because, you know, we were four four hours away from our parents, who were our support, our support mechanism, if you like. Yeah. Um. But yeah, but you know, you kind of get on with things in football, and that's 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 what we do, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's good good to know that you said about Mick because obviously Mick took over from Bruce. Bruce, I'll be honest with you, doesn't get the greatest coverage on here from ex players that come on because a lot of people no. didn't like him. But he signed yourself. He signed some really good players, Paul Kerr. Um, yeah. He signed some uh, Alex Ray, and he signed Alex Ray. Did yeah. No, I think Alex said he came unless, unless, yeah, because obviously Bruce well, maybe for me anyway, so he could have done. He could have done. Yeah, he, he signed some really good players, Bruce. Obviously, the season before you came, we missed out narrowly in the playoffs. He was playing some really good football, but then yeah, exactly. The season you come, we finished fifteenth. It didn't really work out for him. No. Just, you know, no, it was it was tough. Yeah, it what was really you, tough. What, what, what you? I mean, it'd be good to hear some positivity because obviously you liked him as a manager. He worked for you definitely. Yeah, well, listen, I, I think we all accept. That, you know, it didn't, like I said, in, in the initial months when I came down, you know, I, you know, I always, I always try and be open and honest. You know, I wasn't playing, I wasn't playing great. That's for sure. I wasn't. Um, and, you know, Bruce had a lot of faith in me and, and you have people like Ian Dawes, who's a terrific footballer, mm. who was kind of not in the team because I, I come in and, and again, that's the switch when, when Big Mick took over. And Bruce took some stick. He took some real flack, you know, back in, you know, them times when it was getting a bit, Hairy, scary at the old den, and and yeah, um, again, unfortunately, yeah. See, my my respect for Bruce will never wane um, because we had a really strong relationship at Middlesbrough. He took a punt on me to come down to Millwall, um, and obviously the staff, the staff that we had, you know, I've worked with Steve Harrison at, at you know both at Middlesbrough, at Millwall, and and very briefly um, in the national team. 
The best so, of great stories on him. Some great stories. Oh, again, so Harry, Harry's an amazing character. But again, whatever whatever the stories may or may not be, I have to say Harry's one of the best coaches I've ever worked with. Oh, no, yeah. Well, I've well, only heard, we've only heard brilliant things. Well, great things like he'd fall down the stairs, he'd fall top to bottom down the stairs. And, but uh, but uh, that aside, people said he was an unbelievable coach. Yeah, listen, again, what I would say is that Harry's uh, Harry's dad was an end of the period performer in Blackpool, so he was a comedian. Oh. So Harry Harry was born in, he was born into entertainment, and he actually maybe should have been a comedian. But as I say, he was a terrific football coach and a terrific man. But yeah, literally, I mean, when you say li- anything, we spoke about we spoke about uh, Gaza. Um, Harry Harry was Harry was hilarious, and when you talk about for dressing room relaxation, for banter, for Getting people a bit of togetherness. Steve Harrison is 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 the best. He's the best I've had in in throughout my career because he's just he has that really good connection with players and 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 the hierarchy and, and as I say for for getting people together, getting people having a laugh, having a joke at the right time. In all fairness, um, but that was a slightly different thing. So Harry was working really hard, and and obviously Bruce was the manager. And my my relationship with Bruce was. Very authoritarian, um, you know, going back to Middlesbrough, clean shaven. We always had to, you know, we always had, even though I didn't need to shave when I was 24, um, <laughs> everybody had to be smart, uh, clean shaven yeah. and and have a, you know, respect and honesty and trust. And so there was a bit of, as, as good of a coach that Harry, I think Bruce found it really difficult that Harry's relaxed side was probably a bit too relaxed for him. Yeah. But... It worked and it was working, but it, it just, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, these things happen in football clubs. Yeah. It just wasn't quite working for the club at the time. Um, so they needed a change. Harry had left under a bit of a cloud, which I was, again, really hard for me because Bruce had made me captain. And obviously there was some really some strong characters in that Millwall dressing at the time. And, and that won't have gone down too well, even though, you know, they were teammates, they would all support. So I had to sit down and have a chat with with um, with Bruce when Harry left the club, just saying I thought it wasn't a good thing to do to let Harry go. Not only was he a brilliant person, he was a brilliant coach, and we needed we needed that. Bruce saw it a different way, so so unfortunately Harry left, um, and thankfully went on and had a, a fantastic career at other clubs. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then very shortly afterwards, you know, it turned a little bit not great for Bruce, but yeah, we. We still speak. I had a conversation with his son Gregor, who, who is now academy manager at uh, Wigan the other day, and and we still have very, very, you know, a very, very strong bond, uh, and always will do because he he was always he was very good for me as a as a person and as a player, really. So yeah, yeah I can understand the guys who were at Millwall when Bruce came in and probably tried to put that, you know, that that stern kind of authoritarian stamp onto the football yeah. club probably just rubbed up some people the wrong way and that happens um but no great man for me great we played, man we played and, some and great stuff under him. we scored some scored a lot of goals as well didn't we yeah yeah um, again because i know for a fact that it, you know he, he was he was a, he was a terrific coach as well bruce um mm. and and i have no doubt in my mind that when he came to millwall he would have tried to get colin todd on board um and maybe it was just too it was maybe just too far for toddy and um yeah, so when I when I came down here and, and he had Ian McNeil with him and, and obviously Harry was in the building, yeah, it was it was very different. But yeah, it just sometimes it works and sometimes unfortunately it doesn't. But as I say, yeah. in football things happen to us all and we 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 have to get on with it, don't we? Yeah, it's just I think it's a lot of time where the players can jump on board. And like you said, he went on to do really well. Bubble which in turn got in the Arsenal job, didn't it? So fair play to him. I actually was um I track I'm always looking for people online, you know that. So I tracked down his son. <laughs> Before it'd be nice to get Bruce on the show. I don't know if he'd do that sort of thing, but give his side of the story. Well, listen, I would I would suggest knowing because I've I mean he lives in Cornwall now and 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 lives a very relaxed as you know he's uh, and again he we we kind of meet up occasionally at the uh, you know we we did a we did a get together for all of the lads who played for Middlesbrough in eighty six eighty seven when the club went into liquidation. Then we had our double promotion because one of the players, a guy called Gary Parkinson, who's actually a year younger than me. Um, developed a, a syndrome called locked in syndrome. So basically, his mind and body are sharp as a tack, but his body doesn't work. Um, yeah. And he's been he's been in that state now. I think for I think about fifteen years. Um, so his family, his wife and family are amazing. So we got we got together 
probably about five years ago, maybe, maybe not as long as that, five years ago, um, back up in Middlesbrough and Bruce drove up from Cornwall because, as he always said, there's that, there's certain point in your life and your career that a certain group of people will have a connection and that group of players from that time in Middlesbrough will, will always have that connection and, and, and I'm sure, you know, the likes, like I say, Alec will speak very fondly and, you know, the, the reunions that'll happen with certain certain teams at Millwall, you know, under George Graham, et cetera, et cetera, that them, yeah. them bonds are never broken between between players, really. So, so yeah, it uh, for me, great man. Um, and, you know, I, I wouldn't have a hard word or a bad word said about him, but that was because we had a, we had a history before I came to Millwall. No, it's good to hear, mate, because obviously he was a good manager and, you know, didn't work out for me, like you said. But he did have, or clearly have a place. He said he must have done something right along the way. You know, don't work out every single time. But he leaves the club. Um, so that first season for you at the club was nothing really. I mean, I looked down to try and pick something out. Uh, I picked <laughs> out your free kick against Leicester. I don't know if you must remember. It's an absolute rocket. How are, you, yeah. how are you convincing the manager to let you on set pieces as a centre-back? Well, to be fair, I'd scored, I'd scored a few free kicks again in my youth. And and, and again, the one, the one thing that, you know, so when Bruce, so when obviously Mick was in the building when Bruce was there. So when Bruce was there, he knows because we spent quite a lot of time on ball striking. Because I, you know, I, I was always um, when I was a midfield player back as a kid, I would always, you know, score from long distance. And <clears throat> so Bruce would put me on free kicks, uh, knowing that you know we'd done a lot of work on being able to bend and fade. And so, so yeah, so so that ability, that ability, thankfully, has always been there, and you know, it, it carried on. It carried on in my career, thankfully. But, you know, at certain points in your career, you've got to accept that if there's a free kick from somewhere, there's certain people that will take the free kick. So, mm. you know, I, I could take a free kick from long distance. But, for instance, when I moved to Nottingham Forest, there's a certain Mr. Stuart Pierce who says, any time the ball's within 25 yards, you're not getting anywhere near it. <laughs> and I even managed to convince Piercey. So so I must, have, I must have been able to do something OK. So, yeah, I would score the odd free kick and, and et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, let's say uh, Bruce left, Big Mick come in, and then the 92-93 season, you played 41 games, scoring four goals, a few on the telly as well. Yeah, uh, we did. We got, a, we got a few games. We got a few games that season. I mean, to be fair, we, we played some really good stuff. I know we got we got knocked out. I know we fell just a little bit short, and we got you know we got knocked out of the cup by Arsenal after replaying Dave Seaman saving three of our five penalties, I remember. I watched um, it earlier, so I was going to ask yeah, you that. Yeah, um, so a it's like, time. yeah, so... It's one of those that, you know, we, we played some good stuff. As you say, when you think about modern modern football coaching, and you mentioned, you know, previously about Mick asking Alec Ray to play on the right side of a diamond. For me, for me, that's genius. When I was when I was managing at Hartlepool, I, I, I played a diamond because I feel it's a it's a really good formation. So it's a, it's 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 finding the right people to do things. So but yeah, I mean we played some good football. Um we had a few that like you say, we had a few live games on the telly. Um, I got a bit of recognition, a couple of man of the matches on them games from, I think Theo Foley was the, uh, was the, was the, was the guy who was the pundit at the time. So, so that was nice. And you, you, again, adds to that little bit of recognition that you're gaining. We have, we have some really, really good fixtures against Arsenal again, which elevates our status. But unfortunately we, we, we fell just that little bit short. Um, you know, I think, I think we finished seventh and, I know, I know we weren't in danger of getting into the, the playoffs, but, you know, we, we were the next best. And it was just a shame that we didn't really have that little bit extra just to just to push because, you know, we, we, were, at, we were a decent side to finish seventh in the championship. And the championship doesn't change from then to now. It's still a crazy league um, when anybody can beat anybody. Proves that we weren't, we weren't, we weren't that far off. Huh? Barber to doors. Certainly nobody picked him up. <laughs> well, that's certainly uh, cleared your point, Brian. They are going for goals. That's a great goal. Absolutely great cross. Great header. Super goal. So, Theo, keep quiet. <laughs> no, it was loads of goals that season. I think a big change would have been the formation of the partnership, John Goodman and Jamie Morley, and then Malcolm Allen just behind them. Mad Malcolm, yeah. you know. Yeah, Malcolm was a see. Malcolm was a really clever footballer, um, yeah. really clever footballer. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, he played for Wales and 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 had a fantastic career himself. Um, so Malcolm was a clever footballer, as you said. Jamie Morley came in. Jamie was like, you know, he was like uh, like Will o the Wisp. He was everywhere. 
you know, he was a really, a really enthusiastic runner. And so, yeah, so, and yeah, we did, we, like I say, we created, we were creative. Um, like you say, I had this conversation with, with Alec Ray just last week when we were chatting, when I was down at Reading, um, that, you know, about midfielders and, and having that instinct of, you know, danger as a midfield player, but also having that instinct of when's the right time to break forward and on the back shoulders of your of your opponent and, and sneak into the box and score. And Alec was fabulous at that as well. I mean, Alec was a fantastic scorer of mm. spectacular goals as well, but he also had a really, really canny knack. So playing on the right side of a diamond actually gave him more opportunity to, to sneak in on the back. And um, so, yeah, we were we were all right. We were a decent team. We just... We were just a little bit short of, of the better ones in the division, unfortunately. You mentioned it uh, briefly, the FA, sorry, not the FA, the League Cup game. Yeah. Against Arsenal, a little bit of for you of a taste of things to come because he was going to move to the Premier League. But did he even right play that night? Was he key? <laughs> yeah. Was yeah, yeah. yeah, so when people ask me a question, which is when, when they mention about, you know, because obviously I was only a centre-half for, like I said, the last 15 years of my career. Um, and so when people mention it, Ian Wright for me was 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 the thing I think which sparked me into can I actually you know how how good can, how good can I be because mm. Wrighty's movement is phenomenal his speed and strength is phenomenal he's obviously really aggressive but given half a chance in the right area he scores so when I, when we did play against them and Wrighty was playing a you've got to be completely switched on and concentrated because his movement is brilliant off your shoulder. If he gets half a yard on you, you can't catch him and he's going to score. So, so yeah, you're right. Um, not that it was ever in, in, in the thought process at that point, but when you're playing against people of that ilk and then you go on to play against really top-end strikers, um, it does. And at the time, that second season, when you were playing against people like Andy Cole, again, who goes on and has a phenomenal career and mm. his movement and his speed and his finishing ability when he was at Bristol City, um, you know, it, again, absolutely phenomenal. So, but yeah, I mean, I, thankfully, I've, I've, I've become um, over the years. Uh, you know, Ian Wright and myself have, have had some some decent um, some decent competitions. We became friends. Um, so every time we do see each other around and about, still have good crack. And and as I say, he was alongside Alan Shearer was probably the two best strikers, English strikers of my generation. You know, mm-hmm. one for sheer power, pace, speed, strength. But righty, they, what they both were, they were capable of looking after themselves. So if I tried to kick them, happily, happily go into a fight, um, and I, to try and stop them would probably be trying to kick them was probably the only way I could stop them. Um, <laughs> but they were both phenomenal finishers, phenomenal movement, and like I say, you give them half a yard and bang, it's a goal. So, so yeah, it was it was an eye opener for sure. But one that you're right stood me in good stead um, moving moving forward into me in, in my career after that. Makes me uh, laugh for you, right? Because obviously. We, we played them that year and then we played them a couple of times in the FA Cup, 94, 95, 95, 96. He has a bit of a ding-dong with Casey Keller. He's getting serious grief from our fans. And then a few years ago, he did, I think it was the Watford game where we beat him 1-0 in the FA Cup. And he says, oh, I grew up around the era. I'm a Millwall fan. Now, he's a hero now. because he's with yeah. us. Yeah. Well, to be fair, you know, he, he, again, he, he, you, kind of, you kind of, again, I, I always had that, the, the, the things that the strikers I played against, you know, again, I would, I would go to war with anybody, knowing full well, if I'm brutally honest, you know, and I, and I kind of did realise at certain points in my career that you, I'm prepared to go to war with anybody because sometimes going to war with them is the only way. But with the likes of Shearer and Wrighty, and there was others, of course, but they're the two that stand out in my mind that would quite happily go to war, but then would take you the other way and, and score goals. And, and two phenomenal strikers. But Wrighty obviously had that real... That real edge, that real, you know, that real aggressive edge as well. You know, he would he would happily hurt you, happily score and happily rub it right in your face. <laughs> well, we've spoken about strikers. They speak about your central defence partner, which I believe is a mill legend, Keith Stevens. What was he yeah. like, Rhino? To be fair, I have to say, when when people give when people give people legend status, sometimes I, I I'm honest that I I feel as though it's not it's not deserved. Yeah. For Rhino, it's one hundred percent deserved. Uh, a more dedicated. Listen, we, me and I was having Alec, I was having conversations with Alec Ray about this. Only, like I say, only in the in the time that I've been spending with them down at Reading. You know, people like Rhino deserve that status. I mean, we we had we had some good times and we had some fun, but dedicated, 
hard as nails, got the best out of himself in every inch he possibly come, was never going to be the quickest, mm. but would always be very, very competitive, was a leader, was respected in the dressing room and a harder footballer I've yet to meet on a football pitch. Someone, and I know you had Terry, Terry Ehrlich, who I never played with Terry, but I know Terry was uh, in that kind of ilk as well, but <clears throat> a harder footballer I've never met in my career. A harder footballer, harder working, but a genuine nice guy. And he, he was one of the ones that when I came into the dressing room, and there was a few Northerners at the time, you know, the likes of myself, Aidan Davison, Ian Bogie, Paul Stevenson, you know, we had a few, we had a few Northerners in the dressing room at that time. But Rhino was always one that you felt as though you had to impress. Um, mm -hmm. because you again you go back to what you actually have to do in order to to give yourself any credit with Millwall fans. Rhino epitomized everything. You know, he got every inch of everything out of himself. Um so yeah, for, for me to play alongside him that season was a was a was an absolute joy because if you get into a pickle, no one, no one, no one's arguing with Rhino. If you, you, you know, he can, you know, whatever people may think about the perception of Rhino, he was hard as nails, but he could play. Mm. He was brave, and like I say, you're never going to be the quickest, so he has to be, he has to be switched on and, and thinking ahead of the game in order not to get done by pace, which he was very, very good at. So, no, nothing, nothing but the highest regard for Rhino, and, and as I say, he was one that I was more than happy to try and gain some kind of level of respect for because mm -hmm. legendary status is, is 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 earned and he definitely earned it. I think that, you know, obviously we know as fans it, what he was like on the pitch and that he was a one club man. But I think speaking to ex-players like yourself, the feeling you really get is like he was a great captain off the pitch as well, like, you know, away from the football and well, away from the pitch. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, listen, back in back in the day and again, you know, people give people give modern day footballers a bit, you know a bit of grief about whatever they want to give them a bit of a grief about. But we we were able to have a bit of fun, and we, I, I say fun in in the nicest terms about about camaraderie, team spirit. In in our day and and the generation before, team spirit and camaraderie were were probably earned in the pub. <laughs> so you know, and we did spend a bit of time. We did spend a bit of time in the pub, but again, at the right time, you know, you work hard. We would play hard of a Tuesday afternoon or whatever um, after after a hard training session. Strangely, and, yeah, str <laughs> strangely enough, I couldn't remember the name of it, but Alec could. Yeah. And <laughs> and, uh, and Alex Alex not Alex been sober for twenty years, so so it just shows his his memories absolutely spot on. I couldn't remember the name of the pub, but you're dead right. When he told me, I went, "Oh yeah." Was it? <laughs> but yeah, but people like Rhino and and like I say, Alan Mack. Um, you know, people like that. Uh, yeah, I think you've got you've got to have, and again, because I had it at Middlesbrough, if you like, you've got to have people in the dressing room that that have that core of of, of Millwall, if you know what I mean. So, in order to gain respect, in it, you'd have to show that you were you you were prepared to be prepared to go to war. Mm. You were prepared to you you know, like I say, people's perceptions of rhinos that was just hitting hard, and but no, rhino could play. Rhino could play and on and off the pitch, he was a great man. And like I say, we, we had we spent some time together. We all we all had a bit of fun at the right time. And and through them times, you know, like you say, he, he was a in my opinion, he was he was a he was one of the best captains I played with, actually. Um and like I say, I've captained every time I've every team I've played for, but the people that I've played under and captains that I've played under, when you talk about people that have something within their core, you know, I had it with Stuart Pierce at New at uh, Nottingham Forest. Definitely had it with Rhino um, when I was at Millwall for sure. Yeah, it's um, it's good to hear, man. It's not no surprise that everyone spoke so highly of him. So we've skipped. We're leading on to one thing, and we skipped another, which was my fault. But they're related. <laughs> your last ever Mill game and your first ever Mill game, because your debut, I believe, was against Middlesbrough. What was your <laughs> reaction when the fixtures came out? Oh, fuck. Yeah, oh. <laughs> and and as I say, for, purely for the reason that. Um, you know, I'd been at Middlesbrough since I was, yes, yeah, like I said, since I was 13. So by 24, you know, 11 years, but I'd been been in and around the first team for seven years, if you like. So then formative years, um, yeah, my, and, and as I said, the, the one thing I always say to the Middlesbrough fans, you know, when I, when I went back, um, is that if I hadn't have left Middlesbrough when I was 24, 
my career would not have, I, I would not have had the career. I had to, I, I believe in my heart and soul that I had to go away and prove myself somewhere else uh, in order to feel like a proper footballer again. Mm. And when I went back here, yeah, obviously on, on day one, I mean, obviously they were pleased because they beat us 1-0, I think, and I think Robbie Mustard scored. Um, it was at Aston Park that would have been, wasn't it? Yeah, and uh, it was either Robbie Mustard and, and yeah, I think Stuart Ripley skipped past me and crossed and I think Robbie Mustard might have scored who'd just come in from Oxford for Middlesbrough. So, so yeah, I think that the punters, obviously I got, I got, I got a hide in from the supporters. You know, you, you've left the club, you join the club, you, your first game back at that club is against your former club. It can go one or two ways. Um, and uh, thankfully, you know, it's one thing I said to Alec the other day, I've never played against Millwall in a competitive fixture since I left. Luckily. Yeah, but well, no, well, maybe so. Because no, Alex no, no, said, no, when he left, um, and he said the first time he went back, I think he was playing for Sunderland, and he said he got he got dogs abuse. And I said, well, in in my memory, and I, I think I'm I've never because obviously we they moved to the new den in the summer that I left. I'd I've never played a competitive fixture at the new den. I'd never played at the new den until I played in the charity matches, which the fans had for uh, you know for my son. So so it was amazing, really amazing to um, amazing. It's always amazing to go back because, like I say, I, I never even though we were, we were moving to that ground in that summer. I've yeah. never actually played a competitive fixture there, which is a shame. Moving on to your final ever game for me, well, which would have been the last ever game at the Den. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and it, like I say, it was it was one of those that, unfortunately, we knew that we weren't going to be able to get into the playoffs. And but I think none of us none of us knew what the summer held. Um, you know, there'd been a lot of talk because again, we'd had a good season. We'd had some recognition um, individually and collectively. Um, and just falling short. Um, so yeah, the, the the summer should be in your mind. It's it's like a, a you should be excited because it wouldn't take an awful lot for us to be in with a shout for next season, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, but things things like that unfortunately happen, and and things change. Yeah. What was your memories of that last day at the dinner? I mean, Casey Keller came on the show. He told obviously he got stuck at the far end. And he said he got back to the dressing room and literally just his pants. It did. And we remember because we know we knew for a fact, like you say, Casey, <laughs> Casey. Yeah, we remember Casey again because we. I think we were all uh, we were all wondering where he was. Uh, sat in the dressing room, but no, um, no. I have to. I have to be brutally honest. I, I got down the tunnel pretty sharpish. Not not for any other reason other than you know we just saw everybody ready to go, and I just think we all we all just thought exactly that. If we don't if we don't get down the tunnel sharpish. We're going to be out here. We're going to be out here for hours. So, so no, you're right. I remember when Casey. I remember when Casey came back in the dressing room and just his pants and all. We were all just sat there, just <laughs> and it was a, quite a funny moment to say the least. If we don't get down this uh, this change of room quick, pretty quick, we're going to get Caseyed and end up in our pants. Yeah. <laughs> remember, I think, yeah, I think, more, more well. point, I think Casey, Casey was thinking that. After, after, I think Casey was thinking after the punters were coming down the tunnel with him, even even in the, even in his pants. Brilliant. So you spoke about obviously you left the club then in that summer. Um, you spoke, Mick, you know, handled it really, really well. And this is what I said um, to, before we went to start the show. Usually this is the point where you go, well, your contract ran out and blah, blah, blah. But obviously you went on to the Premier League, not in a forest, £1.7 million, which was a lot of money followed in, in the footsteps of Teddy Sheridan, who'd left the point yeah. think, two years before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And obviously Teddy, had, yeah, yeah. Obviously Teddy left, yeah, left, left forest when I did to go to Man U and I was to Tottenham, I forget. Um, but yeah, so literally... I came into Millwall when Teddy had just left, and then I went into Forest as Teddy's just left as well. So <laughs> I never actually, I never actually got to play with Teddy. And you know, we had some good ding dongs over the years as, as players playing against each other. But uh, yeah, he'd, he'd have been one, I think, for sure. Again, if you take a little step back, if te if we'd had Teddy in the team as good as Mally Allen was, if we'd have had someone like a Teddy Sheringham in the team who could create and score, we we would have probably been a bit closer to the playoffs than we ended up in the end. Yeah, well, listen, you had a fantastic career, over 600 appearances. So don't worry, I'm not going to make you talk us through the forest and then back to Borough. But yeah, I just want to talk a little bit, obviously, about post-playing, did a bit of coaching, did a bit of managing. You ended up um, as part of Gareth Southgate's under-21 team. Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's again, things happen. Um, so when I went back to Middlesbrough and, uh, you know, at 31 um, from Forest, um, it was kind of... You know, I got to I got to 35 and then it's kind of, you know, um, at the time, you know, Brian Robson took me back and 
you know, and I, I kind of, I kind of knew that I wanted to do something to, I don't, I think give back sounds a bit cliched, but I knew that when I was a kid and when I was a young player at Middlesbrough, anybody who, any of the older players who had a vested interest in me as a person, they would come and put their arm around you, have a chat with you. It's how are you doing? Is there anything that you need help with? Blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Always for me resonated. Mm. So when I became that player, when I when I went back to Middlesbrough, I always had a I always had a thing for any of the any of the younger players that came into the first team squad. Excuse me, I would always try and make sure they're okay, feel comfortable. Is there anything that we can do to help you? Um, so it felt it felt natural to as soon as I finished um, really competitively playing. I mean, I, I didn't retire; I was thirty nine, but. Really competitively, I wasn't. I probably wasn't playing from thirty-seven, mm. um, but the, the the club itself had said, you know, we want to. I was still fit. I was still part of Steve McLaren's squad, even though I didn't play very regularly. Um, I was always there, ready, and 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 I would spend my time the afternoons. I would spend working with Dave Parnaby and the youth team. Then I would start on my coaching qualifications, and me and Gareth, and obviously Gareth. Um, got kind of thrust into the manager's job um, after the uh, UEFA Cup final in Eindhoven when Steve McLaren left to go to England. So Gareth became the manager and um, and basically at that point, I was the under-18 coach at Middlesbrough um, looking after the youth team. Mm. When Gareth got the manager's job, we'd obviously, we again, going back to, to mates, you know, we'd, we'd been mates first and foremost. We'd been in the dressing room. We were both, we both went on our coaching journey together. You know, we started with our A license and went through to our pro license. We did that together. Um, and when when he got offered the manager's job at Middlesbrough, he said, you know, we're both very inexperienced. He said, I need to get on with this. And, <clears throat> and he had Malcolm Crosby with him at the time, who was a good man, uh, still is a good man and a, gr- a very good coach. He said, you need to continue with your coaching. So I moved up to the, the reserve stroke under 23 group, as it would be now. Um, and worked in that for six months. And then by the Christmas, I was working in the first team setup with Gareth anyway, um, you know, just because he felt as though he needed me. We had one brilliant season, and then unfortunately, Middlesbrough got relegated the year after. Um, and, and you know, I left Middlesbrough when Gordon Strachan came in after Gareth. I left in the summer of, I think it was 2008, 2009, maybe. Um, and... Yeah, so basically, uh, in that period, you know, I then, I was assistant manager at Bradford City, <coughs> um, had a short spell, well, I had a spell back at Middlesbrough again, got my shot as a manager at Hartlepool, and then after I left Hartlepool in 2014, you know, I was out of football for 18 months, um, and then the FA were changing, um, Gareth had gone in to the FA as a, like, um, to work under Sir Trevor Brookin. He wasn't one of the national coaches. He was, he was, uh, he was working alongside Trevor Brooking, um, so Trevor Brooking, and and gaining some experience. Um, and as you say, then there was a point where Gareth was appointed uh, under twenty one head coach, mm. and you know they had a they had a they failed to qualify out of the group in twenty fifteen for the under twenty one Euros, um, and then they decided the FA decided they were going to do a restructure. Um, as in, they were going to um, they were going to split the game into in possession, out possession, and, and transition. And basically, I was asked if I was interested applying for one of the positions. Um, I did, and um, and yeah, after after uh, the FA's rigorous interview process, which it is, thankfully I got I got a job. Um, and originally, it wasn't I wasn't working with Gareth. Uh, originally, I was appointed as um, lead out possession coach, which meant plotting how the England teams would look without the ball from under 15 all the way through to the senior team. At that point, they didn't have a connection really between the development process and the senior process. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so yeah, so then I was asked if I want, when I first went into the FA, Gareth said, do you want to come to the Toulon tournament in the south of France with me and Steve Holland um, as an assistant? Um, and I said, yeah, of course, that'd be brilliant. So we went down to Toulon that year. And thankfully, that was the start of the England development process. It's their, their golden 
time, if you like, you know, from 2016 through to 2019, England, England development teams won more. Uh, you know, we had um, we had under 17 Euro runners up. We had under 18 world champions. We had under 19 Euro winners. We had under 20 World Cup winners. Mm-hmm. The under 21 team who I worked with uh, with Gareth and then on with Aidy Boothroyd, we got knocked out in the semi final of the Euros in 2017 in Poland, um, and for, against Germany on penalties. Strangely enough. And then won the t- so we won the Toulon tournament three years on the bounce. So yeah, it was a really really strong period for England development football. But in that period, um, there was that changeover. You know, when Sam Allardyce got the England job and then didn't have the England job, oh, yeah. and basically they put Gareth in as, as temporary charge. Um, and Ad Boothroyd came from the under twenties to take over as head coach for the in, in a temporary charge of the under twenty ones. And Gareth just again said, he said, you know, you you need to stay with AD and the under 21s and stay with that group. And I need to get on with with what I need to get on with Steve um at the senior end. So, which was great. You know, I'd love to work with Gareth at the senior level, but you know, I had a really I loved the the two and a half years I was at the FA. Um, you know, like I say, it was a brilliant period for England, young England teams, um, winning tournaments that had never happened in the history. Um so yeah, so it was a really, really good period, and 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 as I say, when I left in in 2018, it it wasn't it wasn't really what I chose. I mean, I was missing day to day football, if I'm honest, because at the FA you have a lot of time where you're kind of twiddling your thumbs, or you're in conferences, or you're doing you're doing various things, um, which which wasn't my nature. But when you're on camp with the with the group of players, uh, that's like being back in a football club, and it's brilliant. Um, so yeah, I, I didn't I didn't leave the FA. Um, you know, it was it was a it was a hard one to leave there, really. But as I say, on on the back of that, you get other opportunities. But thankfully, I have to say, and what happened when obviously when Gareth accelerated up to the senior group is we had the development pathway, and obviously you see that. So at the very when I was in the FA, you had Jude Bellingham who was captain of the under 15s with with Kevin Bexy, um, who was the head coach then. And now you see Jude Bellingham has gone through the pathway all the way to the senior team. Yeah. Purely and simply because he's a super talented young man, but because that pathway is now there. And I think, you know, we took an awful lot of, an awful lot of um, what Germany had been doing. Yeah. Restru- we restructure. Plot, we plot, yeah. We plotted a lot of the restructure around the pathways that the Germans had put in place. And obviously Joachim Lowe coming from, um, you know, the youth development teams to be the senior manager and, and bringing the players through that development pathway. And I think we had a lot to learn from the Germans. Um, and thankfully, just before I left, we had, a, <clears throat> we had a conversation with the German coaches and they were wanting to learn from us again. You know, what are you doing that we can learn from? And strangely enough, you know, because of that, that kind of rivalry that everyone is, is there without a shadow of a doubt, there's a lot of collaboration between both FAs to try and make football even better. So that's, really? yeah, yeah, it's really strong, really strong that, you know, there's a conference every couple of years to share ideas and share, you know, again, just trying to make youth development better, trying to make young national teams better, which ultimately will make the senior team better. So I think, mm. you know, thankfully, I think thankfully for us as a nation, you know, Gareth had had that structure there. Yes, we undoubtedly have some unbelievably talented players and we have some leaders, you know, that we spoke about with people like Rhino. You know, you've obviously got leaders within that dressing room, whether they wear the armband or not. Um, and like I say, you look at the likes of, you know, the lads who've come through, the Marcus Rashfords, the Jaden Sancho's, the Duke Bellingham's, the Phil Fordens, the et cetera, et cetera. And you can go on and on and on. And, and, it, and it's it's been a really brilliant it's a really brilliant treadmill that these lads have, have just been able to come through. Um, I think they're our team so good, but it's so young still, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. And and while we know that process still goes on, I mean, obviously the youth teams are not as prevalent in winning tournaments anymore, um, but the process is still in place. <clears throat> and obviously there's been another restructure since I left um, where they've kind of changed the structure around again to try and develop and help and improve. And as I say, you don't see the England youth teams winning major tournaments, unfortunately, at the moment, but you're st- we're still producing decent players, thankfully. It'd be nice to see the uh, first team win some. It's, um... Yeah, well, <laughs> wait, let's let's be honest. In 
you know, you go back, as we all do, you go back to 1966. We've, we've now had two semi-finals and a final. So we, we, we're, we're edging. We're edging yeah. closer. It's, um, I, I forgot he even managed the 21s. He's so prominent as the England manager now. Don't yeah. forget he managed the 21s. But yeah, it's pretty like you've had it. You've had a great well, listen, at the end of the day, we spoke about your ups and downs. Like I say, Gareth was was pretty much going to be hounded out of the under-21 job when when the team failed to qualify out the group in 2015 mm. in the, in the, uh, the under-21 Euros. And then, like I say, one year later, um, a slightly different group of players then go and win to London for the first time in 20 years, um, which... Is only a B grade, you know. You don't get the high level. You don't get the Brazilians. That you know, the, the Italians. They don't. They don't go. But you still got to beat the Portuguese, the French. They were, you know. So we to win that tournament for the first time in twenty years was great. Um, and then, as I say, that that period thereafter, with these players coming through, you know, the likes of, like I say, Jude Bellingham playing at fifteen, and then you've got Phil Ford and Jaden Sancho and Mark Gooey, who's now obviously come to prominence playing it playing in the under-17s uh, Euros, which Steve Cooper was the head coach of. Mm. Um, and then you've got people like Dominic Calvert-Lewin, Tammy Abraham winning the under-20 World Cup in South Korea. So the the, the pathway is there. And, and, and thankfully for English football, and, and I say this hand on heart, not just because he's a mate and, and not because we've had a lot, of, a lot of journey together through our coaching, etc., is that if Gareth hadn't have been the senior team manager, if we'd have still kept cherry picking someone from somewhere else we, this wouldn't have happened so mm. i think we have to we have to think it was a it was a genius selection even though gareth thought he wasn't ready at the at the time um you know he's obviously grown into it and has been the most successful England manager since Alf Ramsey. so we're not too far off no no he's done really well good to be like to know he was part of it it must be like something special do you know what i mean no great as i say when you when you see the teams and and obviously the coaches who are involved and like you say, you've got someone like a Steve Cooper who's come from a completely youth development background yeah, nice, um, nice. at Liverpool um, to go into the FA's setup, um, show himself as a, as a very exciting young coach with some really good ideas, and then do the jobs he's done at Swansea and at, at Forest um, is amazing. You know, it just shows that um, it just shows that you know the the, the selection of coaches and. You know, sometimes young coaches who haven't played football, who haven't played football at a certain level, yeah, don't, don't carry baggage. They don't carry baggage of failure and fear. And true. Um, well, I mean, on the flip side of that, when you got the job, Cooper at Swansea, I, I think, mm, well, the players think he's never played, or when they think stick to the kids, mate, sort of thing. You know what I mean? Is it harder to, harder to get that respect in in a sense? Well, yeah, it it, it is because you don't yeah. you don't have the kudos walking in the in the front door for sure, but you've yeah. got to earn it and. You know, the one thing I would say, because of his links with the FA, if you look at Swansea's first season, because he had Mike Marsh with him, who who worked with him with the under-17s and under-18s. Ex in England. Liverpool, Mike Marsh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ex-Liverpool player. So Mike Marsh was with him, and Mike, again, is a is an excellent coach. I know he's not at Forest with him, um, which I didn't understand, but that's, you know, that's life. Um, but yeah, but they also drew on... So they had, uh, at the time, I think Mark Gooey went to, to Swansea... Uh, Rean Brewster went to Swansea, so they 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 brought in some top top quality young young footballers who were probably ready for Championship football. Um, so as well as moulding the players into a style and and a and a and a philosophy, um, which was in Steve and Mike Marsh's kind of vision, if you like, they also had the ability to bring in some really top talent, which you know which both give them some backbone and and some good footballers to play from front to back. And in people like Rian Bruce, the people who can score the drop of the hat. So, it, it, yeah, so the, he's done it. I think he's done it really well, Steve. Um, I think he's, you know, and, and, and as I say, because obviously I have a long uh, association with Nottingham Forest as well. It's nice, it's nice to see them on the rise again because, you know, again, it's one of the things I always say. The, I, think I think they're going up now, I think, this, this year. Well, yeah, and they've... So I left, I left in the summer of 98. Um when both Middlesbrough and Nottingham Forest had been promoted, we were promoted as champions and Middlesbrough came second. Um, Nottingham Forest were, were relegated the year after and have not been back since. So it's it's a real shame for them. And, and um, yeah, let, fingers, fingers crossed anyway. But, you know, Garrett, yeah, you know, really enjoyed working with him and Steve Holland in the FA setup. And I'm really, really chuffed that that's continued, you know, certainly in the years, um, in the years after I, I left the FA. Mm. 
Mate, I, I could talk to you all night, but I don't want to yeah, meet you mad. So, well, um, I skipped over your England caps, which I'm, I apologise for. Yeah, two caps. I apologise. But um, we'll wrap it up with um, two questions I always end with, Millwall related. If you could go out tomorrow with three of your ex teammates, your old Millwall teammates, game of golf, night out, whatever you want, which three are you picking? Well, to be, <clears throat> I think it would depend on which way the night goes. <laughs> um, you know, if you're talking, if you're talking about we're going out for some, uh, if we're going out for something sensible, then not sensible because I think the lads that we played with, we, I don't think we did much sensible. We we had a right, we had we, no, we did. We had like I say, even though we were all either uh, young families, fathers, we we had we had a good laugh. Uh, I've always kept in touch with Alex, and and as I say, I've just reconnected with Alex recently. Over at Reading, I've been doing a bit of work with him and Paul. So Alex would definitely be there. Now, would it would it be Alex uh, of of two thousand of, of twenty twenty two, or would it be Alex of nineteen ninety two? That would be the question. Alex would definitely tell me it would definitely be twenty twenty two and not ninety two. You would not be too. We all recognise that we 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 had we had some fun, and Alex was Alex was always front and centre. Um, but as I say, he's uh, he's a he's a very different man to what he was in, in 1992. So Alex would definitely be amongst it. If you're talking for sheer, uh, Rhino would be there for sure. Um, you know, because we had we had some good times. Um, and the third one would be a difficult one because you could go you could go someone like Malcolm Allen again, who would do anything for for a laugh. And him and Alec Ray bounced off each other like nobody's business back in the day. It would be. It could be somebody like a John McGinley, who again is a, is a crazy Scotsman, who would you know you you'd have, definitely have a good laugh. Somebody like an Aidan Davidson, who's a big daft Geordie goalkeeper, who's nuts. Full stop. He's been on the show, um, Aidan. Yeah, he's mad. Um, brilliant. But again, if you think of Aidan Davidson, nineteen ninety two, to Aidan Davidson, twenty twenty two, again, two completely different people. Yeah. Um, but we all we all change. We all get older. So yeah, I would I would suggest that um, yeah I would suggest that Alec Ray, Keith Stevens, and Aidan Davidson would be the three I would choose. Brilliant. But man. then it, if if I'm if I'm allowed, I'd obviously take Mick with as well because Mick, you know, Mick was Mick was both a friend, a manager, and a player. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'd enjoy a game of golf with Mick, but not maybe not the other side. <laughs> Do you know what I heard him on the Millwall official podcast? Like the club have got an official um, like podcast, and Mick was on it, and he was great value. Like. He's swearing and the stories he's coming up. He's, he's a brilliant bloke. I mean, we, you know, we, we've said many times, you know, the, the, the times that we had with Mick, um, you know, and, and again, this is no disrespect to Bruce, but we just, I think Mick, Mick basically got Millwall because he was as tough as he was, you know, he was as tough as he was as tough as a docker. He was, he was hard as nails, but again, he was, he was a footballer. You know, if you think about Mick McCarthy's career, mm. it's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Played at home and abroad. Obviously played in World Cups with the Republic, managed the Republic. Absolutely phenomenal football career, Mick had. And, and thankfully, again, he's another one that even after all these years, we still pick up the phone occasionally, say hello, and he's just a just a, an absolute diamond of a fella. So um, so yeah, if, yeah, for for catching up purposes and 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 some good, honest, open conversation, Mick would Mick would be amongst it. But if we're just going back to 1992. It would be a toss up. It would be a hard toss up between Aidan Davison and Malcolm Allen, but it would definitely be Alec and, and Rhino. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. And if you could pick one standout memory from your time at the club, what would it yeah, be? yeah, really difficult, actually. I mean, again, if you if you think about, um, and I think the the memory bit is is the is the hard one for me. It's like you say, you know, I look back and, and if you think about, yeah, like you say, over six hundred league appearances and seven hundred and odd, yeah. and trying trying to pick out things, I, I think. You know, it's always so. It's always nice to score against your old club, which I managed to do against Middlesbrough one time at the Den. Um, again, with a nice free kick against Kevin Poole, who was it was like an ex teammate. Um, I think, I think, in in on the whole, I think the experience that I gained more than anything. Again, you know, remember when I said yeah. to you back earlier, I had to, I had to go and rediscover myself as a footballer, really, yeah. and to be given that opportunity. So the memory would be the people that I met. Um, and when I came back down to the club for the Middlesbrough game only a few weeks ago, the people that came over to say hello who have been associated with the club in all the time that I've been away and were with the club then, I think it's more I think it's more a case of the two years could have been 10 years because A, we fitted a lot into the two years, but also the, the memories that were created. And, and as I say, on the back of 
you know, the tragedy that my family um, went through, the Millwall fans, for only having been at the football club for two years, the Millwall fans were there 100%. You know, they couldn't wait to do things. It was the first place that, um, it was the first place I went uh, because they were the first group of people that got together to try and show, show a bit of love and to try and raise money for, for the charity that we were starting. So uh, I think rather than in memory, it would just be the fact that Millwall, Millwall, even though I was only there for two years, that the people have always had a really kind word, really warm welcome and reception when I come back and they were there when I needed them. That's brilliant, mate. That's really good. And say, um, your little boy, your charity you started up, do you want to, you still go with that? No, no, we, uh, because, uh, because, you know, unfortunately, um, Finley would be 22 now. Um, so no, we, we, we closed the charity down, uh, in 2019 because he'd have been an adult. Um, and we were raising money for children's charities because obviously he was only a baby when, when we, when we lost him. So, so no, we, we closed it down after 12 years. Um, we raised almost three quarters of a million quid and give it away to children's charity. So we just feel as though the legacy in his name was done. And, um, and yet, because he would have been an adult when we closed it, we just felt it, it, it had a, it had a quite a poignant end really. So yeah, as I say, the Millwall fans were, unbelievable through that time and I'd never be able to thank them enough. That's brilliant, mate. Well, there'll be plenty watching this, hopefully, for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on, mate. I really enjoyed your time. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And, uh, and, and as I say, it's, uh, even for two years, it's always a club that I'll hold very close to my heart.